colleagues here at the school. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all, uh, Charlie in particular, and John, and all of your friends and family. Uh, you're very welcome here this evening. Um, times like this bring us courage and wisdom. And at times like this, people like Charlie Fell bring us courage and wisdom. And I think it's a privilege for us, and I use the, the, the word advisedly, a privilege for us to have Charlie with us here this evening, uh, back to the place where he teaches and educates us. And I use the present tense advisedly as well. So you're all very welcome. I give you Charlie Fell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kieran. I would like to thank all of you for coming here this evening. Special thanks are due to Cormac McGinley and Deirdre Hegarty for organising the event. I would also like to thank Evelyn O'Rourke, who couldn't make it tonight, for, for working heavenly behind the scenes to promote the work I have been doing for pancreatic cancer. After receiving a terminal pancreatic cancer diagnosis in 2006, Randy Pausch gave a lecture, a last lecture in 2007, which is pretty common in American universities. As the difference was that he was dying of pancreatic cancer. This evening I'm going to speak on a topic Randy Pausch did not speak about, pancreatic cancer itself. I'm doing this because this cancer is a neglected disease and someone needs to speak about it. This story needs to be told. Unlike their high profiles, all of these people above died of a very low profile disease. Most of them kept going until their bodies would no longer let them. At his last show, Bill Hicks, the comedian, called out to his girlfriend, I can't do this anymore, and asked his girlfriend to take him home. When Patrick Swayze was told he had pancreatic cancer, he used his, he said to his wife, I'm a dead man, but he still used the time he had left to speak out in support of pancreatic cancer until the day of his death. This is the plan for this talk. I'm going to pass over to my brother John now for the next few sections. Okay, thanks a lot. Charlie, so um, what I'm going to do is um, talk about um, awareness, uh, funding and research um, of, of pancreatic cancer. Um, what Charlie has uh, learned from his, from his uh, researches that he has carried out over the last two years since his diagnosis, he has spent a long time, as I think many of you are aware, learning about this disease, uh, trying to understand it and of course trying to understand what the what the future for it could be in terms of whether or not progress is being made on the research front to um, bring about a cure for pancreatic cancer. This is a question that Charlie asked me, I think, very soon after his diagnosis. Do you know where your pancreas is? Do people in the audience know where their pancreas is? I think a lot of people don't know where their pancreas is. Well, it's there. Um, it's deep in the abdomen. It's not easy to reach for tissue samples. It makes diagnosis, treatment and research of pancreatic cancer difficult. It's sitting between your stomach and your backbone, basically. And so it's very difficult to see it uh, in scans. Another question that Charlie has often asked me, do you know what your pancreas does? We even had this discussion today. Uh, what does your pancreas do? Well, it's a gland that performs two key functions. One is aiding digestion and the other is regulating the metabolism. It does pretty important stuff. Um, you can't live without your pancreas. Not to my knowledge anyway. Maybe there's a doctor in the house who would contradict that statement. Ranked by incidence, pancreatic cancer is considered to be rare. Uh, we looked up what is the definition of a rare disease. Uh, there is a commonly accepted definition of a rare disease. A rare disease is a disease that, aff that, that afflicts five in, in, in 10,000 people. Um, by that, <coughs> criteria, uh, pancreatic cancer would be considered to be rare in terms of incidence. Uh, 484 people died of pancreatic cancer last year, um, and that compares with uh, the other cancers that you can see on the chart. This comes from, this is Irish data. Um, in terms of top 10 killers, uh, pancreatic cancer is in 10th place. 
Again, that's by incidence. But can it really be considered rare when it's ranked by numbers of deaths? Here it's in the top five. And you'll notice that the number over the bar for pancreatic cancer is almost the same as the number that I had on the previous bar. Basically, everyone who gets pancreatic cancer dies. And they die quickly. And so, ranked by, in, by, by deaths, can we still say that this is a rare, a rare cancer? Because most of the other cancers that are to the left of that chart, to the left of that bar, people actually do survive, uh, often from, not all of them, but most of them. Um, <clears throat> These are some statistics in the United States, but I think they apply also to, to, um, to, to Ireland, to Europe, to any, anywhere in the world, because incidence is more or less the same in most parts of the world. Um, lifetime risk uh, of getting pancreatic cancer is 1 in 68. So you have a 1 in 68 chance of getting pancreatic cancer at some point in your life. I don't know how many people in the room there is, uh, and what that means in terms of how many people in this room could eventually uh, succumb to pancreatic cancer. More people die in Ireland each year from pancreatic cancer than die on Irish roads. Um, I think this was a statistic that, that Charlie brought to my attention. Um, and I found, it, I found it quite shocking um, that we could still say that, deaths from pan that, that pancreatic cancer is a rare disease when it has two and a half times the number of people dying than die on the, on the roads in Ireland. We know <coughs> so much about one killer, but we know very little about the other. The outlook also for pancreatic cancer is not very positive. Um, these are again US statistics. Um, and these are the top five killers in the United States, top five cancer killers in the United States. And you can see um, at around, the, well, it, it starts at, the, the, the line starts at 2010. Uh, but you can see that <clears throat> the ranking is about the same as it is in Ireland today in the, in the charts that I showed earlier. But a lot of progress has been made in research for breast and prostate cancer, and you can see that the incidence of deaths from those, from those cancers is projected to decline and decline, decline significantly um, over the next number of years. Lung cancer too um, has been researched, and there is also an expectation of a decline there. Pancreatic cancer is on the rise. It's going to become the number two cancer killer in the United States, and I think we could probably expect to say the same for, for, um, for Ireland too. Little is known about what causes pancreatic cancer. We've looked at lots of different research um, on this, and um, you look at different, different analysis and you get different, you get different risk factors. Um, family history is one that is, that, that is sometimes mentioned, and in fact there, there is one very tragic case that I don't know if people in the room are aware of, and that is the, the case of Jimmy Carter. Jimmy, Carter's, Jimmy Carter, the former president of the United States, his, um, his father died of pancreatic cancer. Um, he had a brother who died of pancreatic cancer. I think the brother was fairly famous um, in the media during the time of Jimmy Carter's presidency. And he had two siblings, who died, two, two sisters who died also of pancreatic cancer. In addition, the mother died of, of, a, of, a, of a cancer that ended up in her, in her pancreas. It didn't start there, but um, she, also, she also died. So Jimmy Carter is a bit of a phenomenon in terms of survival for his own family. Other risk factors that are mentioned are obesity, diabetes, cigarette smoking is, is mentioned for, on occasion. But then when you look behind the data a little bit further, you find out that only 30% of the cases um, are, can be related to cigarette smoking. And that's not, too much, that's not too different to smoking rates in the general population anyway. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole list. Um, I, I went from the, 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 the fact-based to some of the more interesting analysis that have been done recently. There was one study that was done that shows that the incidence rates are higher for people who are living far from the equator than people who are living close to the equator. The theory there is being that more sunshine uh, reduces your risk of getting pancreatic cancer. But I think you cannot exclude the last factor that's written on this slide, bad luck. Um, and I think some people in the, in, in the cancer research area will, will acknowledge that there is a lot of luck involved in, in, in cancer and, 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 and um, becoming a, a cancer patient. Diagnosis is difficult and uh, although th there are some telltale symptoms and here I would invite Charlie to share with us a little bit about the symptoms um, that, that he had um, before he had his pancreatic cancer diagnosis. Yes, well, <clears throat> I was hit with the classic triad of symptoms, which are, number one, 
um, abdominal pain, um, second weight loss, and uh, third jaundice. Is is uh, I go to the first the. Uh, Abdominal pain was not of any serious, was not of a serious level for for months. Is is and certainly, if I had gone to the doctor, um, he would have thrown me out on my ear, and told me that I was a hypochondriac. Um, the second one is 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 weight loss. At the time, I was working very hard, and so weight loss was not exactly um, a surprise, not to me anyway. Is as, and as we move to the third, is um, at the time I had uh, consulting work, lecturing here, um, and um, jobs in two other areas. And it, this was at a period after uh, the recession, and uh, I certainly felt in no position to give up the work because I felt I wouldn't get it again. And I t also, I'd taken, I'd taken the work, um, um, so I wanted to finish it. Is is but uh, uh, in reality, uh, the reason why I didn't react is because I'm an idiot. Is um, you know, if you turn yellow. There's something seriously wrong with you, and I think it would be a good idea to go to the doctor. And it took me um, it took me weeks to do so, and that was under pressure from friends. And it was my wife Anne who finally brought me to a G G my GP um, in the middle of um, April. I was suffering for about five weeks, and five weeks. Is in you know as the pain got worse, um, and um, the weight loss got worse. It, um, it 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 really is a long time to go without um, you know taking the decision yourself. Is is the GP immediately? I think I had five minutes in his office before he told me to go to uh, intensive care, and I went to intensive care. Um, I almost died that uh, in in those first um, early days, and uh, soon um, after um, after uh, can't think of the word, but the word where they cut the bit out of you. I learned I had pancreatic cancer. I was I was like the rest of the population, or certainly a lot of the pop, most of the population, was not aware that um, uh, was not aware that uh, pancreatic cancer was uh, such a deadly disease. I was in hospital for quite a period of time and had uh, what's known as a Whipple's operation. Is, is, We're going to get is, to the is, Whipple is, operation part in a oh, minute. Oh, we'll get that. Yes. <laughs> Jump, jumping ahead I, of me. I, yeah. I, 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 <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> I, I, okay. So other facts, um, as Charlie said, I mean the the, the 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 symptoms are what they are. Some of them are, you know, not so unusual symptoms, and so it wasn't until I remember when I saw him at yellow. I mean, I knew that there was something serious wrong. Um, anyway, it's usually it's a disease that is usually diagnosed too late to be curable. Um, I have there the incidence rates in terms of when <coughs> a patient presents themselves to the doctor. It's again US de US data, by the way. When a, when a patient presents them to the presents themselves to a doctor, what stage they're at, and you can see that the, that the majority, fifty four percent, are presenting at stage four. Um, stage 4 uh, pancreatic cancer has a survival rate of 1.6% over five years. Um, so it's, um, it's, um, now that was not the stage that Charlie was at. Um, when, when it's diagnosed late, as I said, uh, survival is usually measured in months. <coughs> Most patients will only survive five to seven months after diagnosis. Of course, it depends on at what stage they are diagnosed. Uh, where they will be relative to that, and you can see that there, there are the different stages. 
Charlie, what were you told about the stage that you were at when you were, well, when you were diagnosed? Well, I, I, I wasn't told, but from my own research, um, um, I reckoned that I was at stage two. My consultant, um, uh, my oncologist, uh, uh, would, would, would be more aware of what stage I was at, but that's the stage that the, the symptoms seem to um, comply yep. with. Yep. So um, I think Charlie jumped ahead of the, ahead a bit on the slides, um, and he mentioned the the Whipple procedure. Um, the, this is the only effective treatment for pancreatic cancer. Uh, it's the operation that pancreatic cancer patients who are lucky enough to be diagnosed at an early stage get to go through. Um, only twenty percent of patients are eligible for this for for this procedure. Um, you see the before and after picture, and the after picture is minus the, the purple bit. So that's the operation. It's a pretty big and heavy operation. Um, I understand the operation took about eight hours um, to carry out, and it was carried out successfully. Um, in some cases, uh, people don't survive even the operation. Um, it depends on the skill of the surgeon, and luckily, uh, Charlie had a very skilled surgeon who, who did this operation for him. Some of you might have been wondering why we played that music at the beginning. Um, and this um, uh, explains, well, hopefully explains a bit. Uh, Charlie wrote about it in the Irish <coughs> Times article that he had published about his story um, on, on, the, on the pancreatic cancer and about maybe you could tell uh, the people um, uh, how you felt when you, when, well, why you, why, why you wanted to mention it in the Irish Times article and how you felt when you came out of the operation. Well, at that time, Chris, Chris Hadfield was uh, becoming famous for playing David Bowie's uh, Space Oddity in, 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 in the International Space Station. And um, when I uh, woke up, um, um, I felt like I was on a, a massive high um, and uh, because I was alive. And um, I thought to myself, is that uh, I wondered, is uh, who was higher, um, me uh, uh, waking up into the operation, or, or David Bowie on drugs when he wrote <laughs> when when he wrote Space Oddity in 1969? Is 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 I have a feeling that I might have been higher. Is, um, is, uh, uh, I have never seen uh, my brother smile um, as, as, as widely and um, then I slipped back into sleep. But um, yes, it, it was a moment that <coughs> will, will live for me, for, will live for me forever. So after the Whipple operation, of course, um, there was so-called post-operative chemotherapy, and it's, it's sometimes known as adjuvant therapy, um, and that is um, it, it's after the chemotherapy, um, <clears throat> patients have to undergo this to reduce the risk of recurrence of, of, of the cancer. Um, now, these are this is the list of um, of um, side effects that that are, are the standard side effects of the of the chemotherapy drug that Charlie um, um, had. Um, do you want to tell a little bit about your, your, your experience with the chemotherapy, how many sessions you went through, um, what were, you know, up from this list, um, what were the symptoms that really struck you? Uh, well, I, 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 I did more than 40 sessions, I would think, in total. And the worst symptom, without doubt, was fatigue, uh, both um, physical uh, and mental. Um, my um, physical uh, ability was lost. To, to get up the stairs, uh, I had to pull on the banisters. Um, sometimes I had to crawl. Um, and um, in terms of uh, mental agility, I, I would forget what day it was, and um, I would forget that I've had to meet people, and I've never kept a diary, because I've never really had to, or 
you know, to be quite honest, it's more because I'm disorganized. I'm disorganized. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, is, is, is it really mentally, um, yeah, I suffered badly. The other, the, the other, the other symptoms was uh, uh, coordination, is that I couldn't walk properly. And, um, you know, I could, I could trip quite easy or fall. And um, finally, at first, is um, the, uh, I lost sort of half my hair. Is I didn't lose, you know, fully. Is, but when it grew back, it grew back and it was completely white. Is 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 and and it kept changing colour. <laughs> it was uh, it, it was hilarious. Is is is, is, is um, I've never seen anything like it before. So you know, anyone needing hair dye is you know chemotherapy might just be the answer. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, Okay. But finally, believe me, is chemotherapy is really tough. It is really, really hard um, on the system, and um, there's nothing le nothing less can be said on it. Is anybody who's done chemotherapy will know is that it is rough. And Okay. So of course, another unfortunate feature of pancreatic cancer is that it's highly resistant to chemotherapy. Um, the five-year survival rate after the Whipple procedure, you've gone through this, having half of your insides taken out, and you still only have a 20% chance of surviving. Um, the bottom line is that with the mortality rate of about 95% over five years, and by mortality rate there, I mean 95%, 95% of people are dead after five years, diagnosis is practically a death sentence. Those are the words that Charlie used in his Irish Times article. So a quick recap on the figures for the figures people. One in 68 people will develop pancreatic cancer. 85% will be given a survival outlook of five to seven months upon diagnosis. Less than 20% will be able to undergo surgery. In most cases, chemotherapy will not work, and 95% will be dead within five years. So that's the research challenge: um, how to how to address uh, such a such a deadly such a deadly disease. Um, this is a <clears throat> a quote that that, that Charlie found um, that uh, Richard Nixon, in his State of the Union address in 1971, declared a war on cancer. Uh, some of the words are, are, are very nice, I think, in this little passage, but I think the money, of course, that the amount is small because we've had a lot of inflation in the meantime, but I think this passage where he says, the time has come in America when the same kind of concentrated effort that split the atom and took man to the moon should be turned toward conquering this dreaded disease. There, it's almost 40 years, well, it's more than 40 years since the, the, the war on cancer was declared. Um, we found an article uh, that was uh, published in the National Bureau of Economic Research working paper series um, a few years ago, which looked at the question of, is research helping to win the war on cancer? And the conclusions of this, of this study, it's sourced at the bottom of the slide, is that um, cancer uh, research and development has indeed led to significant gains in cancer survival. Um, but they also have a caveat in their, in their conclusions uh, in, in this study, and they say, it may be true that the size of cancer research and development spending is too large or too small on the margin. So what they mean there is, is that some cancers may have got too much research money and some cancers may have had too little. When you look at survival rates, one way of measuring, a concrete measurable of <coughs> what is the output of, um, of research. Um, well, one, one way of measuring that is to look at what has happened to survival rates for different types of cancer. Um, <clears throat> over the last, well this is Irish data over the last 20 years, US data would tell the same story. So this is a ranking, this is, this is all, of the, all of the major cancers um, across the slide. I think, I, I think you can read them out. I'm, I'm finding it difficult myself actually here. 
uh, but you see that, for example, the, the, the highest survival rate is for prostate cancer um, of, of almost 90%, and it improved from the blue bar um, at the early part, in the early part of the 20-year period that we looked at from a little bit over 70%. And you can see that that is the same for, for most cancers, for, for breast cancer, for, for I meant, uh, colon cancer, um, and a number of others. Um, and then you can see across this slide, on the very far uh, right, is pancreatic cancer, its survival rate, and how that survival rate has developed over the last 20 years. Pancreatic cancer is the only cancer that has a survival rate in the single digits. Now, there has been a slight improval there, but in general, there has been very little improvement in pancreatic cancer survival rates in the last 40 years. Uh, American research will tell you the same. Um, and so, uh, th there's almost nothing that compares to it. Um, lung cancer has a, high, has, has a high mortality rate as well. Uh, it would be the, the second most deadly. Um, this uh, curve is what, what is called a survival curve. So this looks at um, the incidence of, of, <clears throat> of patients uh, when they present and how many of them survive over, over the period that is shown on the chart. Here it's a five-year period. For pancreatic cancer, basically, um, more than 80% of patients die within the first year of diagnosis. Um, so those five-year statistics are not so meaningful because um, most people are, 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 are well gone uh, by the time um, you get to the fifth year. And in fact, um, there has, where there has been improvement, it has really been at the short end of the, of the, um, of the survival curve. Um, this is a little bit of research that we were looking at the question of, you know, what, what, if you look at um, that, that, that measure, um, that improvement in survival rates, um, for w what would be a driver for that? Um, because that might tell us something about what determines the allocation of research money. And so we came up, we, we, we found a measure that correlates actually reasonably well with the change in survival rates over the last 20 years, and that is population survival in years. So what that is, is it's the number of people who are surviving from a cancer times the number, of, the number of years that they survive, the number of people times the years that they, they survive the cancer. So when you look at it that way, it's basically saying that those cancers that, people, that, people, that many people get and many people are surviving from are the ones that have had the most research. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see that, for example, uh, prostate and breast cancer have, very, have had very high improvements in, 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 the, in the survival rate, but when you look at pancreatic cancer, it's, it's negligible. There are a couple down in the left-hand corner as well, together with pancreatic cancer. But pancreatic cancer is, in fact, <coughs> in fact the worst. Um, here's another way of looking at it, and it's much simpler. Um, a brief history of pancreatic cancer treatments, um, because it really is brief. There have only been three drugs developed for pancreatic cancer that have been approved by the U.S. Fed Food and Drug Administration in the last 40 years. Um, in 1996, there was, um, I, I have terrible trouble pronouncing that word. It's, 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 um, it, it's, um, its brand name is Gemzar. In 2005, <laughs> I'm not going to go for the other one. <laughs> Um, the other one was Erlotnib uh, Tarseva, and it's in, in combination with the unpronounceable word. Um, and then the last uh, was in uh, 2013, um, that should read albumin bound paclitaxel, paclitaxel uh, abraxane. Um, and this was the, the, uh, the treatment that Charlie was having. Lucky for him, this drug came at basically the same time that he was diagnosed, actually. Um, but as I said, since pancreatic cancer is highly resistant to chemotherapy, um, patients can develop a resistance to that, to that, to that uh, chemotherapy. And because there are so few drugs uh, that are available, there really is no plan B. If the drug doesn't work, there isn't another one. Um, new chemotherapies such as Abraxane, we have to acknowledge that, um, have proven successful in prolonging life. Um, this is a survival curve, again. And it's a survival curve without abraxane, the lower, the, the lower curve, and the, 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 the darker line is with abraxane. It basically only prolongs life by a few months. That's about the best that the research in pancreatic cancer has managed to do so far. 
some reflections on, on, on cancer research that have come out of all of Charlie's research that he has done from the, from the readings that he has done over the last couple of years, all the books that he has bought. <laughs> Amazon has made a lot of money um, out of him over the last number of years. Um, a first message, I think, is the cancer research. We have I to. I would just stop there. Yeah. Uh, job there and say that um, if anyone wants to buy any books on cancer, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I have about 40, I about have about forty you know, on sale. <laughs> And uh, I'll give a reasonable discount. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to, yeah, this is the Lauren and Hardy uh, routine. Um, so I think we can say the cancer research is primarily carried out by, we could identify these three groups, ph the pharmaceutical industry, governments, and not-for-profit foundations, otherwise known as charities. If profit-maximizing uh, pharmaceutical companies carry out the bulk of, of cancer research, it would make perfect sense that they are producing drugs for large numbers of patients um, who live longer. You, you can't criticize the market. That's what the market wants to do. Um, pancreatic cancer is a, is a disease, uh, which we've already shown, that afflicts relatively few who do not live very long. So it's uneconomic for the pharmaceutical industry to devote resources to its research. Again, should we criticize the pharmaceutical industry or should we be looking at other possible solutions? And I think our conclusion is that if the market is not willing to devote resources, doesn't this make a case for public health policy? Shouldn't charities also consider the most effective use of their resources? If all of the pharmaceutical industry money is going into those top and, and common cancers, shouldn't um, the, the public sector and charities be thinking about where their money would be most effectively used. Another couple of reflections. Um, cancers with large numbers of patients who live a relatively long <coughs> period have a strong lobbying voice. You see it from the race for the cure um, and these kinds of things where people can get together and, and, and lobby for, for, for their cancer. With pancreatic cancer, 500 people are diagnosed each year, with maybe 100 surviving longer than a year. So it has no meaningful voice. The people who have it don't even know one another. I think designating pancreatic cancer as rare may have made it less attractive for research. Researchers, and I know that there are a couple in, in, in the room who are not necessarily pancreatic cancer or cancer uh, research, but I think researchers, like everyone, are risk averse and aiming at prestigious publication, may be, they, they may be more likely to research in areas that already have proven success. Um, especially if you're starting out and you're trying to develop a publication record, why would you go for a very tough cancer? And of course, pancreatic cancer, I think it is acknowledged in the literature that it is a hard nut to crack. It is a, it is a tough cancer. Um, and research effectiveness in terms of the failure rates of the research um, may, be, may be higher. We don't know. I know that there are possibly some experts in the audience that could tell us something about that. So isn't there a public policy case to find ways to, to reward researchers for taking the risk to, to research pancreatic cancer? What about endowing a prize for the person who is able to find the solution uh, to, 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 to the cure for this deadly disease? Funding. Um, I think everyone here would know, knows that state funding has done a lot to reduce road deaths. In the period 2007 to 2013, there was a 44% reduction in road, in road fatalities nationally. Over the same period, the Road Safety Authority received 158 million in annual grants from the state, and I think we would all say that that's money well spent. So carrying that over, funding on research could potentially do a lot to improve um, survival rates for cancer patients as well. This is again some research, some analysis uh, from the United States. Um, this, this comes from an article that, that, that was published a few years ago. It looks at the, the, the allocation question um, in the following way. It first of all looks at the relative years of life lost from different cancers. Um, and so the way that the researchers would calculate that if a person at the age of, let's say, a Charlie's age diagnosed with, 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 pan with pancreatic cancer, what would, the, what would have been a reasonable life expectancy for them at that point? And so you can calculate the years of life lost. 
And then they look at the percentage of funding uh, of the, that is allocated within the budget of the National Cancer, Cancer Institute of the United States. And so, <clears throat> in this analysis, if research funding was being allocated in, in an equitable way across that, that across the, the, relative to the years of life lost, then you would see those dots on the, on the 45 degree line that goes through. Uh, all of those dots. Anything that, below the, that is below the dot would be a cancer that is under-researched and underfunded, and anything above the line would be over-researched and overfunded. And you can see the pancreatic cancer actually has the, has the largest deviation from that 45 degree line um, of all cancers. Um, and we, that has quite a collection um, of cancers on that chart. Underfunding of pancreatic cancer is, is not a phenomenon which is unique um, to, um, to the United States. In the United States, just 2% of the budget of, of the National, National Cancer Institute goes to the funding of, of, of pancreatic cancer. But we looked at figures um, from a number of different places. In the UK, the equivalent of the US National Cancer Research Institute has acknowledged that only 1% of its budget goes to pancreatic cancer research. And at the same time, the same report identifies the disease as underfunded given its incidence and mortality rates. In 2011, Charity Intelligence Canada um, also reported that um, they only give 0.8% of, 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 of their funding to, to, to fund pancreatic cancer um, research. We couldn't find equivalent figures for Ireland, um, but anecdotal evidence would suggest that pancreatic cancer is underfunded in Ireland as well. There is some hope um, for those who are not who are who, who are not funding. There's, a, I mean, I think an important point about all of this cancer research is cancer is not national. So the research that goes on one, in one country can, of course, benefit what is going on in in, in in other parts of the world in terms of treatment. In the United States, um, President Obama signed into law the, the so-called Recalcitrant Cancer Research Act um, on the on January the second, twenty thirteen. And here, the, the, the passage is, is there from the, the, um, the, um, from, from the law in terms of what is expected of the National Cancer Research Institute. National Cancer Institute. It is expected to come up with a strategy to devote more resource, resources to cancers that are so-called recalcitrant, in particular pancreatic, also uh, lung cancer. But we think that more needs to be done around the world um, because cancer is not national and every research effort can help. Um, so I'm going to let Charlie conclude with some of the messages that he wants to make, that he wants to leave you going home with tonight on the basis of, of, of his research uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, well, <coughs> first I, I, I want to return to uh, some points that, that John made on the... Uh, difficulty or how uh, deadly a disease uh, pancreatic cancer is, is, is it is so small that it is not picked up, often not picked up in um, scans before a Whipple operation. So you can have, have half your insides taken out and, and yet it's already spread to the liver and you're already on the death list, effectively. So it's 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 a death sentence, effectively, at this point in time, which calls for further uh, research into 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 the disease. Is surprisingly, doctors have a very poor record in diagnosing pancre pancreatic cancer. This needs to change. They need to be educated on the fact that is, you know, prolonged abdominal pain is um, a reason to send um, a, a patient for, for a scan. Is, is, is cases in England have shown that, that some patients have had to go to a doctor seven times before they've been sent to hospital. And by that by that time, it's been far too late. Is is uh, they have the disease, and uh, more than likely, 
um, are going down <laughs> is um, research needs to focus on early detection. Early detection when the chances for a cure are greatest, including genetic testing. It's important to note that um, the pancreas, as John has said earlier, is deep in the body and therefore as a cancer it is, it, it is a <coughs> deadly because it is um, difficult um, to see on scans etc etc so it really needs to be um, looked for early um, because, because uh, any lateness and death is, is well deadly um, public money should be correcting uh, each uh, uh, exacerbating the, next, the neglect of pancreatic cancer. Now I want to peg a point here that is probably going to um, annoy and irritate some people, but um, I really don't care. Is, uh, <laughs> um, is, 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 it's something like this, is that uh, in terms of um, money, public money and debts, and you need to equalize them. You need to equalize them such that, uh, you know, not, not just that, that, that you cut. Um, let's suppose, let's say, the, the let's suppose, uh, imagine that, um, uh, pancreatic cancer um, gets 3% of money but there's 6% of deaths and let's imagine that uh, uh, breast cancer gets 6% of money and 3% of deaths. Now you don't just go um, from 6 or pan breast cancer shouldn't go simply from 6% um, to um, the death rate, it should go further. Is to equalize, to equalize, you have to go further. The cuts have to be much bigger. Is 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 to equalize over time. Is 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 pancreatic cancer. The rate of money that it receives will go up to um, up further than and the money the breast cancer gets. That is the only way you can possibly equalise the death rates, is, is, is by cutting money in that way and allocating money in that way that pancreatic cancer gets a lot more money and uh, breast cancer gets a lot less money. That's uh, not uh, a speech against um, uh, breast cancer. It's, it's, it's simply the facts if you're to um, equalise death rates. That's the maths. Um, policy uh, messages, is, and this is, you know, that I really have to make um, um, uh, I really have to make, uh, you know, something that I don't like to have to do and uh, that, that, that severely criticise the major charity organisations in this country, and when our cancer charities in this country, is first of all we've talked about the allocation of of money, and we've seen that the it goes to, it, it generally goes to breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, all the ones which have survival rates of about two-thirds over five years, while over five years, pancreatic cancer has survival rate of, of, of 5%. Is, is, is now, personally, I find that to be a disgrace. Is, is, is secondly, uh, a, a, another disgrace is, is that last year was the first international uh, pancreatic cancer, uh, World Pancreatic Cancer Day. Now, countries that were represented included poor countries such as um, Argentina, uh, Brazil, 
uh, Mexico is um, then throw yourself over to um, uh, to to the east, and Russia was represented. It's all the major countries, or uh, are, are, are most of the, the wealthy countries, were represented. Is is um, let's for a second suppose we were Scotland. Well, they were there. Is um, at, at the event is. Ireland were not. And one has to ask the question is why does pancreatic cancer not matter? Is that's what that says to me. It doesn't matter to um, Irish charities. Is is because simply an international event like that, um, they should be there. Uh, no question about it. And then we have I think Charlie has a few messages to pancreatic cancer patients um, as well that he would that he would like to give that things are important. Yes, <coughs> uh, I can't give you false hope about the future. Is is pancreatic cancer is a deadly disease? Is the reality is is that. Um, most patients die within a matter of you know months. Is is just depending on um, the degree of spread um, or metastasis. This is I think as you pronounce it at first says spread because it's easier. <laughs> is is is, but pancreatic cancer has no lobby group in this country, and there again is is so. To a degree, patients themselves are to blame. It's because most of the other uh, major cancers, breast cancer, prostate cancer, they have lobby groups. And the more as you go from year to year, the lobby groups get bigger and bigger because of the survival rates and because of the political power that they wield. Is, is pancreatic cancer um, has no power. It's, it's, it's no power in, in public circles. Is, and it's about time that, um, you know, that somebody somewhere is, um, did something about that is, is, and began to build a, a lobby group is is um, I plan as my next project because uh, um, you know I'm dedicated to this cause. Is I plan to um, start a blog, and and, and hopefully we can create uh, power through patients and families and uh, ex extended families. So you know. We look at, we've got to look also at, at, at the, <coughs> I, you know, I don't think I'll have the time for this, is, is, is um, <coughs> simply because it's a disease, but someone needs to set up a dedicated char charity in this country because <coughs> there, as far as I can find, there is, there is no dedicated charity actually to um, to pancreatic cancer, <coughs> I must say that there is a charity that impresses me very much, and um, that is um, um, I know I'll get their <coughs> name wrong, um, but um, they they have an, a, a a a renowned um, person on their uh, on their team, which is um, Professor. Uh, Patrick, Patrick Ford, I think it's uh, breakthrough. Uh, is it breakthrough Ireland? Is it, I, I, I don't know. He's he's up there. Maybe breakthrough cancer research. <coughs> breakthrough cancer research, and um, they uh, are a charity that funds um, our ch funnels the, the money to. Uh, <coughs> cancers that are not uh, well funded and it is uh, great to see 
uh, an initiative um, um, such as that is is one thing to say is 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 one of the most important survival techniques is is that I know of is um, by the statistics I should be dead. Um, I'm um, 29 months uh, diagnosed. Um, I've worked it out vaguely. It's hard because. Uh, <coughs> depending on the, the degree of cancer and the early, the early deaths is, but I probably should have been dead about 14 months ago, is, is and what uh, has kept me going that long is, is essentially hope, is, and so in, in that light is, is, is a, 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 I would like to, to note the case of Stephen Hawking, who had also had a disease, was diagnosed with a disease that had a very short life expectancy. Uh, two years motor neuron disease. He was diagnosed uh, in 1963 when science was very much in its in infancy. And he is still here and alive and kicking today. And so there is always some hope. As he said himself, where there is life, there is hope. And I don't normally wear my glasses, but I put them on today to have the, uh, the Stephen Hawking look. <laughs> <laughs>